As you are able, I ask that you stand for the reading of the gospel. Open your hearts and your minds to the message that John wants us to hear regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nod, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Jesus, Judas Iscariot, the one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common person used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Lord God, as we enter into these minutes of message, may our hearts and our minds settle into what is being said so that we in turn can be also transformed by your word. Guide my mouth, guide our hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Terry and I want to say thank you. You have supported us along our life's journey. You have supported us with your prayers as of August 4th, we will begin our 31st year as Global Ministries Missionaries. And you have supported us since day one with your prayers and your presence. We have been supported financially by you while we were in Alaska. The ministry of Carol Higgins that served us so graciously as a hospital as a manager of the hostel, not a hostel manager. <laughs> you got to say those words right. They all mean the same thing. It just depends on the order you put them, right? So Carol came up. She was enchanted by not only the, the place that she was serving, but also by the congregation and the ministry that we had to men and women and children who were unhoused. She came back and gave that message to you, and you in turn joined us in ministry, not only through your prayers, but through your finances. So, thank you very much. There are 360 Global Ministries missionaries like Terry and myself. You also have been helping us along the way because you are a portion meant for other people. Pays the salary of missionaries. And so I will talk more about that when we get into a session after the worship time. But there are 360 other people in this United Methodist Church that you are praying for around the world, and I want to say thank you for that. Let's transition. Let's go to this dinner party. I shall stop by telling you I was raised in Connecticut, Rhode Island. <laughs> so we had a party. <laughs> we drank coffee. <laughs> so with that understanding, you can now wonder, what is she going to say next? <laughs> so we're going, to, we're going to go to this dinner feast. Lazarus was dead. A few days ago, he was 
in the grave stinking, and Jesus came and raised him. Now we're having a dinner celebration in honor of that. And Jesus is there, the disciples are there, and many other people are also present to see this miracle that was created by Jesus in the form of Lazarus. And as we already read, Mary was there too, and there is no wonder in our minds what, what Martha was doing. We know Martha, her tradition and her history is she is a good Israeli woman. She knows her place. She's in the kitchen. She's fixing the food. She's doing what their culture told a woman she was supposed to do. We know the place for everyone in our culture, too. And so Mary is there, and she comes around, and she anoints Jesus. And from that point on, the disciples have a problem. That's the title of our sermon today. What do you do with a problem? What do the disciples do with this obstreperous woman, Mary? Unpredictable. Absolutely unpredictable. You never know what she's going to do, where she's going to be, or what she's going to say. Think about yourself. I usually go, in my memory, to a Thanksgiving dinner. I remember growing up, we're all sitting around the table, everything's wonderful, everything's good, and you know there's always somebody who's going to show up that's going to, well, you've got to be grand, you've got to be a little bit careful with Uncle Joe because he might say the wrong thing at the wrong time, or, or, or maybe, Aunt Mary is going to say something critical like, Delightful meal, Michelle, but the gravy is cold. <laughs> you work and you work. Do you know the most distracting aspect of worship? There was a survey done. Is it my stole is crooked that's most distracting to you? Is it that my glasses are crooked that's most distracting to you? Do you know what the most distracting aspect of worship is? The church administrator knows. It's the person who comes to you and says, I know you have a 13-page bulletin, and I know you've worked really hard at putting it all together, but did you know you missed a comma? <laughs> the most... The, when you are bored with a sermon, what do you do? You actually look at the bulletin, and you actually start reading that bulletin, and then you notice, oh, they missed a comma, or they, they misspelled the word, and then you go to the house. You have to go to the administrator, and you have to tell that administrator, you know, it was, boy, what a whole lot of work that you put into it, but you know, where did you go? You played the wrong note at the wrong time. <laughs> right note, wrong time. But you just have to know these things. And this is the kind of attitude that some people have. You know, they create these problems for us. And so these disciples, they had a problem because Mary was not predictable. This is the third time we've heard of her. The first time we hear from her, again, Martha comes in and he says, Jesus, my sister should be in the kitchen with me. And she's sitting at his feet and he says, leave her alone. The second time we hear from, from Mary is Lazarus is dead and she runs and finds the Jesus and then she runs with him and she falls on his, at his feet when Jesus brings forth Lazarus. And now we hear from Mary again. The problem is Mary is living in a relationship with Jesus Christ that is out of the norm. You see, these disciples, they all knew who Jesus was. He was the Savior. He was going to bring restoration to Israel. He was going to overthrow all of those Romans and then we, six on one side and six on the other side, we were going to be part of his inner circle. But we had a problem 
because we had some really nutty people hanging out with us. People who didn't go along with the norm and, and didn't dress like they should and, and always spoke up at the wrong time or maybe really sang lustfully when they're Methodists and they should be sitting quiet. <laughs> There's always somebody in the crowd who causes us to feel a little bit awkward or maybe even go so far as causing us to say, wow, do they have something I don't have? Makes us uncomfortable when someone has a little bit more spirit than we have. And, and where did that spirit come from? Mary had something they didn't have, and they didn't know how to cope with her. We lived for 10 and a half years in Moscow, Russia. We went in 1996 with a sophomore and a junior in high school. Anna and Andrew went to Nigeria when they were eight and 10. We lived there for six years. I was a medical uh, person there as a nurse, ran a medical clinic, pulled teeth, fixed broken bones, sewed people up. But when we went to Moscow, there wasn't any nursing for me to do, so I spent a lot of time educating people. One of the people that helped me become Russianized was Ludmilla. In, 1980, uh, in 1996, Russia had just come out of a great depression. The economic depravity had happened because when the Soviet Union broke up, the Russian economy collapsed and there was poverty. Engineers were taxi drivers, doctors were sweeping streets, and uneducated people like Lud Miller had no income. Lud Miller had a husband who was very ill, she had no children, they had no one to take care of her or him, and so we hired Lud Miller to come to our house for two to three times a week, earn some money by taking care of our family, tutoring us in our Russian language, and becoming the babushka for Andrew and Anna. Even though they did not need Ludmilla to be their grandmother, she knew they needed her to be their grandmother. <laughs> so one morning, Anna's getting ready. Andrew's getting ready. Have a good day. And Ludmilla's there. And Terry and I are finishing up our coffee in the kitchen. And we hear, Nilsia! And we come around the corner, and there's Lamilla standing like this in front of the door, and Anna right here. <laughs> Near Moshe, hold it. You cannot go. Tolka prostituta. How do you speak Russian? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was challenging with this little girl who just flew it, you know, but. Tolka <laughs> prostituta. she could not go out the door because she had on red lipstick. Oh. Heaven forbid, only prostitutes in the Russian culture wore red lipstick. And even though it was 1996, and even though communism had fallen seven years ago, culture says this is the way you live in society. What are they going to say about your mother and your father? They're supposed to be missionaries, they're supposed to be preachers, and they let their kid out the door with red lipstick on. What are you going to do? Do you remember? Those of you who are old enough to remember, it was 60 plus years ago when my brother came home with a tattoo. 60 plus years ago. You're gonna be a punk. <laughs> Only punks get tattooed 60 years ago. Only punks. And it's my name that you have. And what are people gonna say about me? This is my father telling my brother he's a punk because he has a cougar on his arm. 
60 plus years ago. This is the way we live. This is where you sit in church, right? I mean, we have that culture even in our church. You behave this way. Ludmilla went on to tell us, during the Soviet era, nobody wanted to be too tall. Because a too tall person draws attention to themselves. You're going to draw criticism. You're going to draw unwanted attention to your family, to where you live and the work that you do. So in 1996, they were still wearing green and gray and black. Everybody looked alike. Nobody was too tall. And with red lipstick on, you are too tall. Mary was too tall for those disciples. Maybe you're too tall. Maybe in your family you're too tall because you're the one who always wants to reconcile people. You know, just leave it alone. They, you know, they said it. They can own it. Just leave them, huh? Maybe, maybe somebody has offended you. How tall are you when someone's offended you? And you're going to pick up a phone and you're going to call it back. How about when, when the issue comes before us in the church? How tall are you going to stand and say, Justice, justice causes me to open my mouth and say, This is not right. It's a risky business to stand in front of a group of people and be too tall. Catch can Alaska. Alcoholics, drug addicts, homeless men and women. Hey, we have a social hall that's empty during the week. Let's invite them 13 feet of rain a year. When a person is homeless, you know they're homeless 24 hours a day? Hmm. Let's be tall. Let's, let's open the doors of our church. Seven days a week, they share coffee hour at potlucks with men and women who otherwise would be on the street. Let's stand tall for these people. Do I agree with their choices in life? No. But justice says, Help people. Terry and I just spent two months on the Arizona border. I have a whole slide projection program and videos of what we did and what we saw and what we heard. And there are men and women that I am looking at in this congregation and we could probably divide us on either side of the aisle. But I saw a grave the side of a road 25 miles into Arizona. Of a stillborn little boy <coughs> whose mother, we know the history of her life now, escaped Guatemala. And on the side of the road in Arizona, she gave birth. And my question when I saw that with my broken grandmother's heart, what pharaoh, what pharaoh was there in Honduras and Ecuador and Guatemala and these nations? What pharaoh was there that is driving their children out of that country. Amen. Amen. They are not coming here to milk your system. Somebody needs to stand tall for men and women who are unable to live in the home safely. 
Mary was a problem because she was countercultural. She came in and she disrupted their party. And I have to think that John, the gospel writer, I don't think he liked Brother Judas. Because if you open your scriptures, you'll see that Brother John was a gossip. Because in parentheses, he says, Judas, you know the thief? Judas, the one who was going to betray Jesus? If we only read the Gospel of John, we would say, oh yeah, he told me about somebody I didn't know anything about. But if you read Luke, and you read Matthew, you will read, and those at the table were indignant. That includes John, doesn't it? But John says, I can write the story the way I want to write the story. I can write the story to make me look like the good guy here. You know, it's all about Judas. Judas was angry. Judas was upset. No, John, you were too, because Matthew and Luke both said that you were indignant by her behavior. Now, being indignant is a whole lot different than just being angry, isn't it? Indignant means I devalue you. Indignant means there's no place here for you. I can be angry with you, Michelle. But indignant says, I don't even want you around. There's a lot of indignant people in this Methodist church. And we need to stand up. We need to stand up in our faith and, wow, can you imagine what happened to Mary? She's anointing Jesus. And then Jesus says, leave her alone. My ears would have been on fire. Somebody came to my defense. He, he isn't rejecting me. Because you see, Mary's been with Jesus for three years, just like Lazarus and Martha has. And I have to imagine for three years, these guys have been making excuses in public for her. You know, she's, you know, she's Mary. We don't know how to get rid of her. She just, she's just always there. And if, and if there's somebody who's going to do something, it's going to be her. So I'm thinking for three years, she has known they don't like me. They don't really enjoy me. They don't really appreciate me. If I never came back to this worship service again, nobody would notice. Yeah. But Mary never quit. Ever quit. Because she saw something in Jesus that the others didn't. And you know why I know that? You know why you know that? Because when he was dead, where were they? They ran away. But she was there. She watched from afar. She followed Joseph of Arimathea to the grave. She was afraid. Yeah, it's a scary business being a Mary. She was afraid. She looked at a distance. She saw where Jesus was laying. And then the next day, she shows up. To anoint him. She was there the whole time. She knew something about that Lord Jesus Christ that these guys did not know. She knew that he had forgiven her. They didn't have anything to be forgiven. You know? They, they were chosen by him. <clears throat> chosen. I remember being chosen to be on the ball team when I was this big. You chose me? I remember when Robert Heathcote, sixth grade, now I'm going back a little bit, <laughs> we had a dance and he invited me to dance. I remember those things changed my life. Why would I remember Robert Heathcote?
from sixth grade because it was so impactful to be accepted. Mary heard Jesus say, leave her alone. I love her just the way she is. And this is the part that my husband really likes. He went, hey. We heard from her, we heard about Mary when Martha came out. We heard about Mary when Jesus raised Lazarus, and we hear about what she did here. Evie, she never opened her mouth. <laughs> Standing tall. 
call when you're 11, 12, and 13 year old girl in our communities and society today? Huh? Standing tall when your drummer doesn't beat like somebody else. What do you do with a problem? You stay focused on the Christ. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have. That's all we have. And Mary knew it. Mary knew that whatever they threw at her, she wasn't going anywhere. Because she knew he loved her. Do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know that Jesus Christ Every time you take the bread and every time you take the cup and it is consecrated, we say this is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you take it in, you have Jesus in you. And every time you take that cup, you bring in that life-flowing And when you know that, here, doesn't matter how tall you are. Doesn't matter that you're a problem to some people. Jesus says, I love you just the way you are. I'm going to ask you to stand tall. If there's somebody that needs a phone call because you've been a disciple and not a too tall Mary, you give them a call. You cross over the aisle. You make the effort. You resolve it. Because if you resolve it within you, you've resolved it with Jesus. Live as Mary lived in a broken world filled with confidence that she is loved by Jesus 